Hey everybody, welcome to the New Market Alliance Church podcast, where you're invited to not just attend church or watch church, or in this case, listen to church, but actually go and be the church. For everything you need to know about our community, be sure to go to newmarketalliance.ca and maybe even drop us a line to let us know you're listening. We read everything you send and we'll be sure to get back to you. Our worship service happens every Sunday at 10 a.m. in person or streaming online. We want you to know you absolutely matter to God and you absolutely matter to us. Everyone is welcome and wanted. Now, let's join today's teaching. Good morning, church. Have you ever looked at your life, looked at the pain and the suffering that you're going through and thought, this is not what I signed up for. This is not the life that I was promised. This is not the life I want to be in. When I signed up for following Christ, I signed up for a good time. And now I am surprised by suffering. We're going to talk about that this morning. Let's first pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this time that we have to dig into your word. This time that we have to look at what you've told us about pain and suffering. God, I pray that the meditation of my heart, that the words on my lips may be pleasing to you. That, God, you would use me this morning uh, just to bring about your truth, bring about your peace, bring about your comfort and your hope. Not just in the lives of those here, not just in the lives of those listening, but in my life as well, God. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So if you were here last week, you'll know Jonathan started a new sermon series on these Christian cliches, these passages of scripture that are taken out of context very, uh, very frequently by the church, these passages that we've kind of clung to without understanding the deep meaning of them. This morning, I want to talk about a passage that's misquoted in, in a famous worship song. And maybe you didn't know it was actually a passage of scripture. The, the song is Sea of Victory. Now, if you were here a couple of months ago, you'll know David Beishausen had something to say before we sang it, and, and he talked about how that victory, that sea of victory, the victory he's talking about is the victory of Jesus, uh, the victory over sin and death that Jesus won. That's not what I'm going to get into this morning, though. See, in the song, during the bridge, it says, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Now, maybe you don't know, this is actually from a passage in Genesis, Old Testament passage, Genesis 50, verse 20. And in Genesis 50, 20, we read this, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. As for you, you meant evil, God meant it for good, not turned it. Now that may seem like semantics. It may seem like, why are you going up here teaching us about one change in word? Again, the song says, you take what the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good. This passage is saying, you actually mean it for good. I'll get into the importance of that in a second, but first, let's look at the context. What's going on when this is said? Jonathan, last week, when he talked about clearing these, these uh, cliches, talked about the importance of context when looking at a passage of Scripture. And the context, excuse me, to this passage, we're looking at the story of Joseph. Now, Joseph's story begins in Genesis chapter 37. If you have time this week, I highly encourage you to read the story of Joseph, Genesis 37 to Genesis 50. It's a lot of chapters, and if you do it, I'll be proud of you. Genesis 37 starts with, we're introduced to this kid Joseph, 17-year-old son of Jacob. Now Jacob is, is the forefather, one of the forefathers of the Israelite people. He's kind of a big deal. And so oh, Jacob loves Joseph. He's actually his favorite son, and he shows it outwardly. J Joseph has many brothers, and Jacob has many sons, and yet Joseph's the favorite. He's lavished on. He's given this, this technicolor dream coat, if you will. And in the story, Joseph starts having these dreams that his brothers are bowing before him. Now, just a, just a word of warning, if you have dreams that your siblings are bowing before you, maybe don't tell them that. Because you see, Joseph tells his brothers, and they're like, oh man, we're going to sell this guy as a slave. And so they do. 
It's a bit of an overcorrection in my books, but anyway. Joseph is sold as a slave, and he's working for a man named Potiphar. And in Potiphar's house, he actually becomes almost an equal to Potiphar. But Potiphar's wife takes a liking to Joseph. She tries to seduce him time and time again, and, and Joseph is like, no, I'm not about that. And what ends up happening is she ends up falsely accusing him of sexual assault. He ends up in prison for two years. Then he's brought out of prison to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams in which he tells him there are going to be many years of harvest and plenty, followed by many years of famine. And so Joseph is put in control during the years of harvest to, to store up enough food so they'll survive the years of famine. And then Joseph's brothers come to Egypt in need of food during the years of famine, and they meet with Joseph. And there's more to the story, but I won't get into it this morning. But what happens is his brothers are afraid, afraid that Joseph's going to get retribution because of what they did to him. And that's where we are when this passage comes about. Joseph speaking to his brother says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In Genesis 45, another time, the brothers are also afraid. The same kind of story. Joseph is talking. Genesis 45, verses 5 to 8. And this is what happens. Joseph says, And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in these lands two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you, to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. So you may be asking this morning, what's the big deal, Peter? One says turn, one says mean, what's the big deal? Well, the way that the song portrays it is as though Satan is in ultimate control and God is running around putting out Satan's fires, trying to turn these things that Satan's created, trying to turn them for good. The story we're told in the song is that Satan has this ultimate authority and God is running around trying to put out the fires. That God is somehow a spin master trying to make things, trying to turn things for good, when in fact God is the one who is meaning them, who is creating them, who is purposing them, who is willing them for his good. So in this, in this passage in Genesis 50, 20 that we're talking about, where it says, as for you, you meant evil, God meant, it's the same word, the Hebrew word shashab, which means to weave or to plot or to devise. You see, Satan is given an illusion of power, when in fact, he's just being puppeted by God to bring about his will. See, God is always in control. God is always in control. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. Colossians 1, 16 to 17, if you have your Bibles. Uh, I have bookmarks, so I'm a cheater, so I may be faster than you. Colossians 1, 16 to 17, we read this. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God holds all things together. He is ultimate authority and power. Job 42 verse 2, Job says to God, for I know that you can do all things. Psalm 95 verses 3 to 5 tells us that the world is in God's hands. God has ultimate authority. Lamentations, Lamentations 3 verses 37 to 39 reads, Who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? You see, our Lord has ultimate authority. He's not turning things for good. He's meaning them for good. In fact, the idea that God would have to turn anything doesn't make sense with the nature of God. 
2 Peter 2, sorry, 2 Peter 3 verse 8 tells us that to God a year is as a thousand, uh, one year is as a thousand years, and a day is a thousand uh, years as well. And, and what we're told there is that our God does not dwell inside of time, but rather he's outside of time. So he doesn't have to turn things. He's never surprised by the schemes of the devil. He already knows them. Now, why does this matter? Why does it matter that God is in control? Because suffering is sometimes a part of God's plan for your life. Sometimes suffering and pain are a part of God's perfect plan. And that's a harsh truth. And this morning, as I say that, I say it with a heavy heart because it's not easy to believe, it's not easy to teach. In Jonathan's words, that don't preach, son. But suffering, I'm going to say it a third time, suffering is sometimes a part of God's perfect plan for your life. In fact, suffering is promised to us. John 16, 33. Jesus is speaking. Turn with me. John 16, verse 33. John 16, 33. As I told you a couple months ago, I was told if you're going to quote scripture, make sure you tell it at least three times so that people can find it. John 16, 33. We'll be looking at John 16, 33. As we read John 16, 33. So you have no excuse not to be at John 16, 33. Jesus is speaking and he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulations, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We are promised tribulations. Jesus tells his people, in this life, you're going to. Not you may, not, well, if you follow me, you won't. No, in fact, you will. And in fact, sometimes it's part of God's plan for our lives. First Peter 4, verses 12 to 18 says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And then in verse 19, he says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. See, it starts, Peter says, don't be surprised by suffering. When the fiery trials come. See, in the Old Testament... It's, it's not really popular nowadays to talk about a refiner's fire, but in the Old Testament we're told that sometimes God uses what's called a refiner's fire in our life. Now I'm from Sudbury and the main export there is nickel, and so what, what they do with this nickel, you mine it, nickel is covered in other bits and pieces when you, when you mine it out, and so what you have to do is you have to put it through a fire to burn away the parts that aren't nickel so that you're left with that pure nickel. And sometimes God puts us through suffering and pain and, and all of these things for the sake of us coming out more pure. The fiery trials come for our good. In fact, they can, this, this suffering and pain is used for the glory of God. In John 9, 3, we're told a story about a blind man, blind from birth. And what happens is Jesus' disciples come to him and say, what did this man do? What sin did him or his parents commit that made him blind? And Jesus said, no, he was blind for this purpose, that my power be revealed in his life and heals him. What we see there is that God willed this man's suffering for his life up until the point of, of Jesus showing his glory in that time. So far, I'm not really selling Christianity to you. It doesn't sound like a good time. So far, Peter, you told me that if I follow God, he's going to cause, there's going to be pain, there's going to be suffering, sometimes it's going to be part of his plan for my life. So why would I be a believer? This is where we can look at some good, deep, spiritual truths. I'm so glad Jonathan last week talked on John, Jeremiah 29, 11, because there is so much beauty in that passage that we miss when we don't read the verses previous. The, if you weren't here or you didn't hear it, 
Jeremiah 29 starts with this whole, the, the children of Israel are in exile. In fact, they're under the thumb of a different empire. And they think that they're going to be saved from it. I'm going to see a victory, they're screaming. And God says, no, 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 you're going to stay here for many, many years. You're going to suffer for many, many years. So get comfortable. And then he says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and give you hope. In the context of suffering, God has a plan and a purpose and a will for your life. Romans 8, 28, another passage that we cling to without having a deep understanding. This, for God works all things for the good of those who love him, those called according to his purposes. We sometimes cut out that last part. God works all things for the good of those who love him, those called according to his purposes. His purposes are good, whether they look good to you or not, whether they feel good or not. In fact, we are told in Luke 14, that we're to count the cost before following Jesus. Luke 14, 26 to 28. That's Luke 14, 26 to 28. Last time, Luke 14, 26 to 28. And Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? We are promised suffering in this life. Jesus here is telling us that we are to pick up our cross. The cross being this emblem, this symbol of ultimate suffering and we're to carry that. We're to carry that. So you're saying this morning, okay, where's the hope? Where's the hope? You promised us hope. Where is it? Let's start by looking at the story of Joseph differently. So you can read Joseph's story as, a time, as, as God not showing up, as a guy who just went through what seemed to be needless suffering, or you can read it to see that God was with him and had a plan all along. See, from the beginning of the story, the part that I left out was Joseph's brother's ultimate beginning plan was to kill him. They were sick of him. They wanted him dead. But, but Reuben comes in, and one of Joseph's brothers, Reuben, says, no, 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 let's not kill him. So they throw him in a pit, and then they're like, now what do we do? He's in the pit. Like, maybe we'll just kill him. But then a caravan comes by, and they're like, oh, we'll sell him. You see, multiple times in the story, there's a but where God shows up. In fact, all throughout the story, you'll read time and time again, but the Lord was with Joseph. You see, you'll, you'll say to me, well, things looked up when he was, at, when, when he was in the house and, and he was helping Potiphar, but then he went to prison. Where was God there? Well, who did he meet in prison? The cupbearer. The cupbearer. And by meeting him, then he meets Pharaoh. And by meeting Pharaoh, he saves hundreds, if not thousands of lives by interpreting this dream. Our God in this story showed up and showed his perfect will and purpose for Joseph's life and for the life of those around. If I'm to give you a little bit of hope this morning, look at Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. We're told, we're promised by God, I will never leave you nor forsake you. See, in the midst of suffering, God is not leaving you. He's not left you. He's not forsaking you. He's there with you, and we see that time and time again in the story of Joseph. Sometimes our suffering is for the good of others. Again, we see that in the story of Joseph, where because of his suffering for many years, he brings about the, the saving of many lives. So the question you're asking this morning is, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? You've told me so far that God sometimes will suffering and pain in my life but that he has a plan and a purpose for it that is for my ultimate eternal good, that he's never going to leave me in the midst of it. What do I do with all that? Let's look, let's look to Paul and see what Paul did. Now, if you are the kind of person who underlines scripture, uh, this would be a good one to underline. Acts 20, verses 22 to 24. Acts 20, 22 to 24. Say it with me. Acts 20, 22 to 24, beautiful. Paul's speaking, and he says this, And now behold, 
I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Wow. How would you like that? You're getting ready to go on a missions trip, and people are like, you're going to suffer! Yeah! Woohoo! So how does Paul do it? Well, let's look at 24. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. You see, Paul goes in fully knowing that suffering and pain await him. But he does it because he has a different perspective. A perspective that he shows us in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18. We'll actually start in 16. Sorry, I threw you off. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18 says this. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. You see, if anyone understood suffering, it was Paul. Paul tells us that he was shipwrecked and beaten and stoned and bit by a snake to add a cherry on top of his life. Paul did not live an easy life, and yet here he says, light momentary affliction. Now my point this morning is not to diminish your suffering. I don't stand here naive to the suffering of this world and the pain that it can bring. And I don't stand here to tell you, well, it's just light, get over it. And if that's what you're hearing, it's not for me. But Paul says, in comparison to the eternal weight of glory, this is but a light momentary affliction. See, Paul's eyes are not on the here and now. They're on the eternal. God's, Paul's mindset is on what God wants, what's going on in the life to come, not in the life here and now. And as he turned his eyes upon Jesus and looked full in his wonderful face, the things of earth grew strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. For this light momentary affliction has a purpose. And what is that? He says it's preparing for me an eternal weight of glory. Paul saw purpose in his suffering. Paul saw purpose in his pain. He said, this is preparing me for the life to come. I'll tell you that uh, a couple of months ago, I, I preached on kind of my experience of suffering and pain. And, and I'll tell you that I don't have this mindset still, and I'm working towards it. But Paul has this mindset where while he's in pain and suffering and imprisonment, he's like, man, this is, this is preparing me for eternity. I pray that we would grow to have that mindset. Finally, I think to put the last nail in the coffin to expose that, that God does not turn what the enemy meant for evil for good, but actually means it for good. Let's look at the story of Jesus. See, because the story of Jesus looks like God had to kind of pick up the pieces after Jesus was crucified, and maybe it took him three days to do that. Well, that's not the real story. See, in Luke 22, verse 3, we read that Satan entered into Judas. What we know there is that Satan's plan was for the death and crucifixion of Jesus. He thought, man, this is the end game. We've got to kill this guy. And it looks like this was Satan's plan, but really, it was God's plan all along. Genesis 3, verse 15, God is talking to Eve, and he says, one of your descendants will crush the head of the serpent. What he's saying is, God's ultimate plan was for Jesus to come and suffer and die for us. God didn't have to turn that for good. He meant it for good. And in fact, our Jesus, sometimes when we're in the midst of suffering and pain and we're asking that God relieve us from it, we don't get the answer we want. And, and Jesus understands that. In Matthew 26, verse 39, Jesus is praying in the garden, God, take this cup from me. Take this suffering and this pain, but not my will, but yours be done.
might I encourage you to add that to your prayer life. As you pray that God would take you out of suffering, that you pray that God would take you out of pain, that you would add on that not my will, but yours be done. Because sometimes that suffering is part of his plan. So this morning I have a question for you. If you are suffering and you're in pain, what are you doing in the midst of it? Now I'll tell you, because I told you a couple of months ago that when I was in the heat of suffering and pain, I was just questioning God and angry with him. And if that's where you're at, that's where you are. I'm not here to slap you upside the head and say, get out of it and smarten up. But if that is your reality right now, keep asking him questions. Keep talking to him. Keep talking to him. You see, in my life, in my suffering, in my pain, as I looked to God, I, didn't, I, I was questioning, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, I was questioning his goodness. How can he be good if he wills this suffering in my life? So I encourage you to turn and look at the cross. Because my God died for me, I know he's not going to leave me. I know he has a plan for me. Why would God give up everything for me just to turn around and walk away? He wouldn't because he loves me. This morning in application, I have a few points. Point number one. This song, I'm not encouraging you to stop singing it. Sing it, but sing it with the knowledge of truth. Sing it knowing that God is meaning the things in your life that are hard, the pain and the suffering. God is meaning it. He's creating it. He's willing it. He's weaving it. He's plotting it. He's devising it for your good. He's the one in control, not the enemy. Let's not give the enemy more credit than he's due. He's nothing more than a lapdog to God. Point number two, pray for discernment. If you are suffering now, sometimes we suffer because of the consequences of our own sin. Pray that God might show you the purpose in your suffering or or where that suffering is coming from. Point number three, pray for peace in the midst of it. You see, we're promised a peace that passes understanding. A peace that the world will not ever come to know apart from Jesus Christ. A peace that says, in the midst of my suffering, it is a light momentary affliction, and it is preparing for me an eternal weight in glory. Point number four. If you're not suffering, it's coming. I promise you. Jesus promised you. I promise you. It's coming. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. And in that, if you're not suffering, find someone who is and pray for them. Weep with those who weep. Mourn with those who mourn. That's what we're called to do as the church, as the body of Christ. Point number five, actively look for God in your suffering because I promise you, I promise you he's there. I promise you he's with you, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, I don't promise you that, he promises you that. Point number six, meditate on truth. As you go through this life and you suffer and you find pain, meditate on what you know to be true. This, I promise you, is truth. May every man be a liar and this be truth. This I know to be truth and I anchor my life on it. And so meditate on that. That passage in Deuteronomy, meditate on those truths, those deep spiritual truths that go past just one verse taken out of context, but seeing the context of Scripture that we will suffer, but there's a plan and a purpose for it. Point number seven, I I encourage you to hold what's said. In in fact, hold what I'm saying right now up to truth. As you sing songs, as you read books, hold them up to absolute truth, lest you be claiming a promise of God that doesn't exist. Hold everything up to truth. Point number eight, count the cost. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, and you're saying, man, I'm really not sold now. Like, I wish I would have walked out after the beginning half. What am I still doing here? Might I bring you a little bit of hope and tell you, listen, if you're with Jesus or you're not, you're going to suffer. You're going to find pain. But if you're with Jesus, you are promised a purpose and a plan that is for your ultimate eternal good in the midst of that pain. And in fact, if you're a believer of Jesus, you know that he is with you in it. You have a friend that sticks closer than a brother, we're told. 
So I implore you, I encourage you men, come and meet this Jesus who died for you, who has a perfect will and plan. And finally, point number nine, look to God. May we learn from Paul that in the midst of pain and suffering, we would look and have an eternal mindset seeing, man, my life is no value if not to complete the course provided me by God. My life means nothing if not to fulfill God's will for my life. I'll invite the worship team up as we pray. Father God, God, we we thank you for harsh truths. Because God, in those harsh truths is such beauty. In those harsh truths, we see your heart and your love. God, we pray that, that you would encourage us today. That God, whatever we're going through, whatever pain, whatever suffering, God, whether we see your purpose in it or not, that you would give us an eternal mindset, a mindset that is not stuck on the things of earth, but on the things to come. God, that we would be able to to say that this is but a light momentary affliction, and that God, we would see your purpose and your plan behind it. God, give us a peace in the midst of our suffering. Give us a peace that passes understanding. God, you are good. God, we know you're good. Pray that you would reveal that goodness to us afresh and anew, even in the midst of our pain and our suffering, that you would show us your goodness, that you would take us before the foot of the cross, that we would see you there, saying, I did this for you because I love you. God, we thank you. God, we thank you that you have a plan, that you have a purpose, that God, the enemy is not in control, but you are. God, I pray for those out there who are suffering. Pray for those who are having a hard time and have a harder time believing that you would have any sort of part in their suffering. I pray that you would bring them peace. God, we pray for ultimate release. We pray for ultimate victory in their life. But God, not our will, but yours be done. Because God, your will is so much better. And your ways are so much higher. For it's in your amazing and powerful name we pray this morning, Jesus. Amen.